I don't know what Are we starting with Adam? We can. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. help him get ready for the baptistry and stuff. Oh, don't get all quiet. It makes it really awkward. <laughs> it's already <laughs> awkward. Paging, Pastor Tom. <laughs> oh, hey, okay. All right. Yeah. Let's go, Steve. Okay. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. Happy Mother's Day. It's great to be in the house of the Lord. Let's stand up and worship. Who am I that the highest king? would welcome me i was lost but he brought me in oh his love for me oh his love for me who the sun sets free oh is free simply come long just to bring something that's a word that will bless your Thank you. 
All right, how are we? We're live. We're going to do things a little bit different for our kids today. We're not going to have our kids' message at the beginning. We're going to invite the kids to come join us for a baptism at the end. So just now, if you are of a child persuasion, if you're a kid, please stand. And instead of coming forward, you guys get to go to your church, kids' church right now. The Sunday school time for you. And then we'll hopefully be able to let them come and join us for a baptism time right at the end. If I could have a couple of ushers come forward just now, we're all just kind of rolling with things today. Tim, you got someone that would help you, buddy? These are message notes, and I was going to hand them out to anybody that was interested in them. Come on up, Tim. Are you an usher? He is today. Thanks, guys. If you would like, come right on up here. Come on up here. These are just the message Stand note blanks. Mm -hmm. So toss a few down the aisles. If I had been with you about one more month, church, I would have done the very famous now Pastor Tom handout method that goes like this. And they just flutter and amazingly land in the laps of people who need them. It's an amazing thing. My goodness. How you doing, church? I want to know. This is a 10 scale, meaning I couldn't be better. This means God's helping me. I'm making through it. This means, what did you just say, Pastor? Okay, how are you doing? Let me see your hands. We got a five. We got tens. Who's having a 10 week? Five day, one day, two day. God's with us. Amen. You know, the thing is, God knows right where you are, and he's willing to meet you right where you are today. The story is told of a jetliner headed out over, over the Pacific Ocean. All was quiet for this evening flight, so they were midway to Hawaii, and the announcer, when the pilot came over the loud system and said, Ladies and gentlemen, that tremor that you just experienced was engine number four. And it appears that it burst into flame and then went out. But don't be alarmed. We'll get to our destination. This is a four-engine craft, and three engines are working perfectly, and that's all we need to get there. We'll just be an hour late. A little murmuring among the passengers. But they said, okay, all right, we can do that. Till about ten minutes later, there was another little tremble. And the, the pilot came over the loud system and said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to say we've lost engine number three, but don't be concerned because this engine, this airplane, is fully capable of getting to its destination. We're just going to be two more hours late. There's a little grumble among the passengers, but the sense of okayness from the pilot made them all okay until the announcement came over the system again. This is your pilot again. I'm sorry to say we've lost yet another engine. But don't be concerned. We can easily arrive with one engine. We're just going to be six hours later than scheduled. To which some well-meaning passengers stood up and said, I've just about had it with the delays. We lose one more engine and we're going to be up here forever. <laughs> you don't know how many engines the person next to you is running on. We need encouragement. In fact, we need the kind of help from each other that only God designed us each other to give. Encouragement and that kind of building each other up is what we're talking about today. In the book of Philippians, Paul writes to one of his favorite churches. After he identifies himself and does the regular greetings, I think I'll just start at chapter 1, verse 1. A letter to a church very like this one. Lots of great people. Paul dearly loved them. And this is how he speaks to them. He says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, 
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I want to pause there. I want to pause there. And I'm going to move a little closer so you know I mean you, not that person next to you. I thank my God every time I think of you. That feels good to hear, doesn't it? If somebody said to you, you know what, every time I think of you, I say, thank God. And that's what I thought when I got a, uh, I saw a Hallmark card. And it said, uh, dear mom, you know that little prayer you always prayed over me every day of my life? And inside the card, it says, Boy, God help you if you do that one more time. <laughs> that special little prayer. Well, you know what? It, we need encouraging. Some of us need special little prayers. Paul says, I pray for you every time I think about you. Man, if we knew how each other are really doing, whether we're frazzled, just about out of gas, only on one of four engines, and if you're a mom, God bless you today. God bless you. We thank God for you. And I don't know, we don't know how you do it. Good heavens. How do moms do what they do? But this passage is just for you. I thank my God every time I remember you. My own mom is still a living. She's a precious soul, but she has dementia. So sometimes she remembers, sometimes she doesn't. So when I tell her stories, I'll tell her stories about some of my shenanigans as a kid. I say, Mom, do you remember? Do you remember? Do you remember? One of the stories that she did, I said, Mom, do you remember one time? I was probably about nine, maybe ten years old, and my best friend was moving away. And you heard me crying at night. Just woke up feeling so lonely, losing my best friend. I didn't understand much about those kinds of things. It was kind of an ache and a soreness that I didn't, I didn't get. When I heard a rustle and my mom came in, she sat down in the bed beside me and she had uh, washed some grapes for me. And I love grapes. So she brought me this little snack in the middle of the night, grapes. She just sat there with me. And that, that feeling of being okay, that mom's here, she loves me, she's steady, made a life impact on me. And so I'll say things like, mom, remember the grapes? She said, I just, just barely do. And I wonder how much just barely time we have to show appreciation. Now, if you've ever bought a new car, new car you know what depreciation is, right? <laughs> The thing gets less and less valuable. Up, one of the definitions of appreciation is the op opposite of depreciation, which is to increase in value. Did you know we get to increase each other's value? We get to appreciate each other. But some of us aren't really good at it. In fact, there's the husband who said to his wife, who's... His wife would be complaining, you never tell me you love me. He says, well, I told you 10 years ago when I married you that I loved you, and if I change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> There's a guy that needs today's message on appreciation and needs Paul's example. Paul says, every time I remember you, I pray. So let's unpack this. Let's look at it together. <laughs> okay. I copied the words down of a funny song that somebody did, gave, told me about. Chris Cagle wrote a song, I don't know, about 12, 13 years ago called Chicks Dig It. Okay, this isn't theological, but hey, y'all, watch this. Daddy's belt, mama's drapes, standing tall on the backyard shed, looking cool in my Superman cape. I told the neighborhood girls, hey, y'all, watch this. My fate was a broken arm. 
my reward a big kiss. When Daddy asked me why I did it, he, I made him laugh out loud because I told him, because the chicks dig it. <laughs> Scars heal, glory fades. All we're left with is all the memories made. Yeah, pain hurts, but only for a minute. Life is short, so go on and live it because the chicks dig it. Now, this might be a commentary just on the fact that boys like to impress girls, and that's there. But we all need to have somebody look and tell us, you're nuts, or you shouldn't do that. Or whatever it is you've, you say after, watch this. Why do, guys, why do boys do that? I broke my arm showing off on a Tarzan move and a tree swing. And my loving mom took me to the hospital and sometimes she would feign the approval, I think, so that the motive to be seen, the need to be seen, is so powerful. Dustin Hoffman was receiving a reward, an award for one of his movies, and he was asked, what is the secret, what is the motivation to do these world-class performances? He said three things. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Dustin Hoffman caught the need of man to be seen, to be recognized, to be approved of. Applause seems so shallow, and yet our hearts are desperate for it. We all need to know how many of us walk with an emotional limp because we never heard or so rarely heard our dads say, good job. Or we rarely heard the teacher say, you can do it. You're, one of the, you're the smartest kid in this class. You're going places. That happened to me in elementary school. I was getting D's and C's. C's on a good day, D's on most days. And she came along to me one day by my desk and stopped and she said, Tommy, do you know you are one of the smartest boys in my class? You are so smart. It's, I'm just amazed at what could, what could happen. And pretty soon I'm just sure your grades are going to reflect that. And I said, why, why, why thank you. Caught me off guard. And somehow I got motivated. By the time I was in high school, I'd mostly sloughed back in old ways, but another teacher said something similar, and it made the, what I remember from the first come to mind. I started applying and started making good grades. Who knew that I wasn't dumb? I thought I was dumb. I thought all the things that my, room, my playmates' friend said to me which was, in Southern language, this is just how they said it, Mars, you ain't no count. That's how it would be said. Now, why kids say that as they grapple, jockey for position in the pecking order of value, I don't know. But I think, I think the, the, the statement found its place in my mind and in my heart. Mars, you ain't no count. And I started to think that. And so why try if you ain't no count, right? Jesus says the exact opposite. He says, I love you so much, this much. And he gave his life on the cross for us. Why? Love. Because he affirmed our value. And that's what we say today is we are simply agreeing with God when we appreciate each other. Now, why express appreciation? We've said it increases our value. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, encourage one another and build each other up. It's easy to stomp down a sandcastle, isn't it? A little harder to make the work of art. We're to be builders, church. Builders of each other, encouragers, affirming, showing appreciation. Ephesians 4.29 says, Speak what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. To build, to speak, strengthening to each other. I remember when I was a children's teacher at Los Gatos Christian Church. I had just come out to California from Alabama, had a southern accent. But I had been working with children in a, in a children's backyard children's club. So I went to a 
the biggest church I'd ever seen. There was about four or 5,000 who went there. And then this great big kids program. And I said, I like caring for kids and teaching them about Jesus. So they said, well, won't you be an intern? And I was. And I, I took the job. What I discovered, though, is that building kids up was harder than it looked because kids already, even at the young age, already had an idea of how they fit, where they were on the acceptable order. Every night at kid, for Kids Club on Sunday nights, the kids would line up down the hall, and there would be like hundreds, literal, literally hundreds of kids lining the halls. And if they stood nice and quiet, they would, from time to time, be, be allowed up early and help set up for Kids Club, which was some sort of honor. Anyway, I was the instructor and the leader. And I made a mistake. I said, all right, I'm looking for about six cute little girls to help me set up. And right when I said it, I realized, I wish I hadn't said that. But I was thinking it because I'd just seen the girls with little cute little pigtails, you know, and you can tell their mom had helped them just dress up just perfectly. Little second, third, fourth grade kids. And the second I said it, there was like this sudden divide. All the little girls that knew that they were cute and adorable suddenly perked up. They knew who they were already. These are second graders. And they suddenly looked like, I, I, I know that's me. Call on me. And others that just kind of melted a little. They knew they weren't the, the chosen ones, the adorable ones the acceptable ones. So I just chose them. One, two, three, four, five, six. And the look just of being chosen to come up and help me set up chairs for Kids Club, the privilege of being identified. Now, they were all adorable, of course. But these ones who didn't think they were, they got chosen. They went. God appreciates us we need to be affirming each other every kid needs to know he's acceptable he's beautiful he's lovable remember one time I taught a message I wasn't uh, I hadn't prepared very much and I wasn't really ready so I grabbed a bunch of balloons and I wrote a verse on each little piece of paper and then on the back of the little paper I wrote I am beautiful and lovable and stuffed it in the balloon and inflated the balloon. And took this bundle of balloons to the youth group. And that was the extent of my preparation. So, <clears throat> mostly. But as I went through the talk, talking about encouragement, not very different from what we're talking about today. Each kid would stand up, pop the balloon, take the little paper, read the verse. And on the back would say, I am beautiful. I am a beautiful and lovable person. What I was not prepared for is what happened. They would read the verse about Jesus' love. So on the front of the little paper, still remembering when Amy popped her balloon and it said um, something about God's love. And on the back, it says, I am beautiful and lovable. I'm a beautiful and lovable person. And she started to cry. So there she is standing, high school girl. She starts crying. And I couldn't help it. I just said, why are you crying? She says, because I don't really believe this. And I said, why don't you? She goes, I don't know. I said, but it's true. So she came over, gave me this hug, and went back sobbing back to her chair. Well, you know how teens tend to follow one another. The next person did the same thing, read the verse, started crying. Just, it got to be every person who read the verse, read a verse, said the statement, I'm a beautiful and lovable person. And then broke into tears. And it infected the boys just as much. Why? Because most of us don't believe it. We don't believe we're acceptable. We don't believe that we are precious in his sight, even though we sang it in kids' school. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Am I really valued? Do I know that? We desperately need appreciation so what should I appreciate well let's look at the passage 
How about if we appreciated people's loyalty? Moms, why you stick with us kids, especially us problem kids, is just amazes me. But we should, we should affirm loyalty. That's what Paul said. He said, in all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Think about those people who've been in your life for your whole life. A mom, a dad, a grandparent, a friend, a teacher who was there back when you were just getting started and stayed and stuck with you when you were dumb and stupid. I remember I, the time I get, got caught for shoplifting. My Sunday, I'd had the same Sunday school teacher for years and years. And apparently my dad thought I needed a character reference of some kind. My Sunday school teacher came down and met us at the police station and just sat with me. I don't know if that was part of my punishment, the embarrassment. But he didn't reject me. And he said, you know, we all do stupid things. This was one of them. I didn't even need the stuff I took. Good grief. Just wanted to impress my friends how brave I was. I could walk out of Kmart with a steering wheel. <laughs> a steering wheel from the auto parts department that did not fit my car. What a moron. But there are people who have stood with us because of the way you've helped me in the work of the gospel from the very first day until now, Paul says. And that's why I say, old saints rock. You guys who've been in this church, I'm talking about you've been in this church, First Baptist Church Taft, for decades. You've seen the coming and the going. You've put up with a change from pews to chairs. You've seen changes in the carpet. You've seen changes in the leaders. You've heard changes in the music, changes in the musicians, changes, changes. I don't mind changes. Just when other people do it, I hate it, right? And I just say, you rock. God bless you. I salute you. I honor you because you are loyal. You endure. That means so much. So what should you appreciate? Appreciate people's loyalty. I, th I mean it. Think of someone right now in your life that has stood with you through the hard times. They need a thank you from you. Second, appreciate people's differences. Appreciate people's differences. Now, this is a little harder because I married a woman who is very different than me. In fact, we find it laughable from time to time how different we are in so many different ways. Now, we've done our best to merge and to think and enjoy the same things, and we do. But even just the way we handle annoyances. Some of you are turtles. When you get annoyed, you pull your head in, and you just kind of bottle it. You internalize and you deal with it. You're like turtles. Others of you are like skunks. You raise a stink and you don't care who knows it. And here's the thing I don't get. Why do skunks marry turtles? But they do. They do. And the hard part is appreciating that God made us differently. I love that one of my favorite kinds of TV is the, the uh, animal channels where the, you know, you got all these from boa constrictors to rhinoceros and all different kind of aspects of variation in the animal kingdom that God loves because he didn't just cookie cutter us to be identical. That's why I love churches that look like this one. My wife said to me, we were at the memorial service, the celebration of life for Nate Mitchell yesterday, and we looked at the people. And Karen said, I love this. I said, what do you love? She goes, this. She just, the people, the different kinds of people from all walks of life, different kinds of jobs, different kinds of clothes, different kinds of accents and visual looks and appearances. She said, I think God loves this. And I said, I think you're right. God does. If he wanted us all identical, he'd have made us all the same. But it takes us a, a bit to appreciate that. 
Because from a kid, we're taught what? To fit in, to be like everybody. In fact, even the kids that are expressing their uniquenesses, notice how they, their uniqueness looks like somebody else's uniqueness? Until they, they have these little clubs, these batches of styles and people. We need to appreciate difference. And this appreciation, when we do, lets us increase the value of each other in each other's eyes. Ice cream, 31 flavors, I like them all. Appreciate, thirdly, appreciate people's efforts. Now this is hard too. So appreciating people's loyalty, that's not too bad. Appreciating people's differences, that's harder. And appreciating people's efforts, now this is what they do and it's not necessarily built on their success at what they do. Those of you who have kids, you've probably experienced the, the uh, activity of making much of effort that isn't all that art worthy, maybe perhaps. We to this day have a bowl that my son made in pottery class. And my wife insists on making guacamole in it. It's our guacamole bowl. It's the ugliest bowl you will ever lay eyes on. It's unfit to be an ashtray. It's just, it's ugly. And she loves it, adores it. Our refrigerator is covered with our grandkids' art. None of it is really art worthy. But it's expressions of them. And we make a big deal out of it. Why? Because it's their effort and we're trying to encourage that. And because we love them. 1 Thessalonians 2, chapter 1, says this. We always thank God for you. How you put your faith into practice. How your love made you work so hard. My son had made us a clock in his wood shop. And it quit ticking. Just broke. I spent more replacing the movement of that clock than buying a new clock, a better clock, would cost. And I've done it twice. Why? Because that clock has sentiment. Why? He made it. It was his effort. We work because of... Um, we put our faith into practice. We work because we love. And that kind of thing needs to be appreciated. So question, folks, if we're in a series on relationships, we're trying to increase the value and the strength of our relationships, what do you think it would do to us as a church if we all became better appreciators? I'll tell you what it'll do. It'll make this church the most winsome church in this county. You're all at one of two things. You're either Teflon or Velcro. One of the two. There are things that we do, specifically the appreciation department. If people walk in the door and the first thing they feel is unappreciated, unvalued, like they don't fit or they don't belong or they're not going to be received, this is a Teflon church. People will just, they won't stick. But if we're the kind of person people can see by the first glance in our eyes, by the welcome, that there's a place for them, that they fit, they belong, you're Velcro. And that's fun to watch when people get stuck because of the love, the appreciation, the encouragement of other people. So let's talk about the how. How do we do it? How do we show appreciation? I'm not talking about the practical but, or the specific words, but what is it, what's it going to look like? What should it feel like? The first thing it's got to be, it's got to be real, genuine. So put that in your slot. It's real. It's genuine. Young people particularly are really good at identifying counterfeits, at seeing it when it's false. Romans 12, 9 in the Living Bible Translation says, don't just pretend that you love others. Really love them. What, is that, what does that look like? 
I saw a bumper sticker. It's an old one. It says, honk if you love Jesus. Nonsense. There's a real one, a better one. It says, tithe if you love Jesus. Anybody can honk. Or, or maybe <laughs> if, you, if you love noise pollution, honk. Or wh- What does it mean to show true appreciation, to pretend, to do more than merely pretend, to encourage people? Let's do, even, let's do a lot more than honk. Let's learn to become good at appreciation, a real way. We sing a song from time to time called Unashamed Love. To express love in an, in an honest and an earnest way. Yesterday, one of the folks who was honoring Nate in the, mor- in the celebration of life wrote this little poem. I, I doubt that Keats or Walt Whitman have anything to be threatened by, but the poem was an expression of appreciation, of valuing. And everybody applauded after the poem was read because it caught in a hmm, in an artistic way truest love and appreciation. Someone will say, well, how do I know how genuine I am? That's where God comes in. God is willing to give us a new heart. If you look into your heart and you say, man, I think I might have had that once. But that loving heart, that that true appreciation, encouragement, I think I might have been that person once, but I don't know what happened to it. Now, that's where God wants us to come to him and to cry out to say, God, my heart has gotten old and crusty. I've become an old curmudgeon. It's how churches die, folks. It's when we get crusty, and Jesus called it trying to put new wine in an old wineskin. And the leather is cracked and old, no longer pliable. Jesus has come to me. I'll help your heart get tender. I'll give you a new heart, in fact. Not a heart of stone, but a heart of flesh. needs to be real. Second, it needs to be recognizable. It needs to be recognizable. Proverbs 15.33 says, What a joy it is to find just the right word for the right occasion. Proverbs 12.25 says, A word of encouragement does wonders. What, do we, what can we do to show encouragement, to help bear someone else's burdens? Moses was one of God's great leaders. And God showed Moses that there was to be a a battle with Assyria. And the Assyrians were a pretty fierce group. So Joshua was the general. And the battle was raging. And Moses, I don't know what first made him decide to do it, but he held his hands up like this. And suddenly something weird happened. The Israelites started kicking the Amalekites seriously in, in winning the battle. And Moses says, well, that's amazing. Put his arms down, and it suddenly went the other way. I wonder how many times he had to do that before the soldiers are going, leave him up already, leave him up. So Moses had his arms in the air, and the battle was going Israel's way. Moses got tired and tired her and tired her. And when he could no longer hold his arms up, two men came up beside him. One, is, his name is Aaron. The other is her, H-U-R. And they stood with Moses all day. He sat on a rock, couldn't even stand anymore, put Moses on a rock, and the two stood on either side of him and held his arm up. What a strange image of what true encouragement is. There are people in this room, I am certain, that need us to hold their arms up, figuratively speaking. We just run out of emotional fuel. Sometimes our roads are so difficult. So I've heard someone say to me, God will never give me a burden greater than I can bear. And I want to say, I I don't say it this way in the moment, but I want to say, I'm sorry, that's false. 
That's not true. God will not give you more than you can bear. He certainly will. He won't give you more than you can bear with the encouragement, with the assistance of the church. Your friends and fellow believers are desperately needed. Sometimes in this life there is challenges and difficulties, and it's more than you can bear all by yourself. God didn't intend to you do, for you to manage it all by yourself. That's why we're talking about being an appreciator. What a joy to find just the right word for the right occasion. In this church, if you see a need, consider the distinct possibility that God wants to use you to meet it. There is a philosophy among churches that the pastor has to do anything that God wants done. You suddenly made the pastor to be the bottleneck of all that is going to be accomplished in the church. And that's a terrible thing to put on the pastor's back. God gave you gifts. You. I'll bet in some way you are more gifted spiritually than I am. I'm not saying I don't have spiritual gifts. I do, and I love using them. But I'll bet there is some way that you are more gifted than I. And the next pastor who comes in here, I'm sure there's a way that you'll be more spiritual gifted than him in some way. So don't, don't let him hog all the ministry. Recognizable gifts. You see a need? Go for it. The last thing I want to say is it needs to be regular. How do we show appreciation? It needs to be real. It needs to be recognizable. And third, it needs to be regular. Regular. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 says this, we ought to continually thank God for you. Paul just said a few minutes ago, we're looking at it, every time I think of you, I pray with thanksgiving. I give thanks to God on a daily basis. Hebrews 13.13 13 says, let us encourage one another daily and all the more as you see the day approaching. Why? So that we don't get hardened by sin's deceitfulness. I can't tell you the times I've been thinking about doing something that I would regret and someone called me on the phone. Now they didn't, they don't, when I pick up the receiver, they don't say, what were you just thinking now? Come on now. No, but just, just the connection. We need to help each other to be, because we realize we're in a hostile environment and God never intended us to stand alone. I want to dare you to do something. In just a minute, we have a couple who are going to be baptized. And I'm going to go back and get ready real quick. And we're going to have a baptism. If we would, Bill, would you mind reminding the kids' workers to have the kids come in? And they can sit on the front row or the floor if they want. But I want to dare you to do something. I want to dare you to encourage someone intentionally to give an affirmation or an appreciation, a card, a wit written one, but do it with some thought. One a day, like the vitamin. I want to dare you to do it for a week. That's a big, hairy, audacious goal. But it's actually once you get started about day four or five, you're going to go, this is easy. I'm getting kind of good at this. A good start would be the moms in this room. Good start would be your spouse, a kid. If your parents are still around, start there. And secondly, secondly, besides the appreciation, to swear off of criticism. That's where you find fault. You point out where someone else has fallen short. Of what, well, you think they don't know? If they do, is it really that serious? It's so demoralizing to have people find your fault, make much of it. What would be, happen if we were more builders than demoers? <laughs> Let's build each other up as we follow Christ's example, as he builds and strengthens us. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd make this a Velcro church. 
people who have become skilled from practice at being appreciators. And while we're thinking of the power of appreciation, the power of encouragement, building each other up, God, we think of those among us who need that inner encouragement. Holy Spirit, we pray for you to comfort and we pray that you would show us how to cooperate with you. We think of these who are new and young in their faith. We pray that you'd give us encouragement to know how to encourage them. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. Okay. Do the announcements. All right. I'm going to have my lovely wife come up and give some announcements. Good morning, church, and happy Mother's Day to all of you. Um, we have a few things going on in the church. As I said last week, we do have our Awana Derby Saturday, May 21st at 5.30. Now, I also told you that they have an event for us wonderful adults because Emily has challenged all of us adults to beat her in the race. So in the back there, Jacob has put a sign-up sheet for us adults to also join in the derby race, okay? And ladies, get your big derby hat out. We are going to have a contest for the best derby hat, most creative derby hat. And men, get your bow ties, your really pretty bow ties, and put those on, because we are going to give, um, we're going to do best bow ties as well. Um, VBS down, is June 13th through June 17th, okay? Um, please speak with Miss Jackie or Miss Judy Wade regarding signing up to help out for VBS. Youth in Christ is coming um, in July, and you can speak to Lauren Mitchell about that. Middle school, which is your 6th through 8th graders, is July 11th through July 14th. And high school is July 9th through July... Uh, sorry, July 25th through July 29th. Your high school is 9th through 12th, and that's also $25. So speak to Lauren Mitchell about that. I was going to bring up... Oh, there you are. <laughs> Justin's going to come on up and talk for a moment. Um, Justin, you want to come on up? Oh, and one last thing. We are still searching for a pastor, so please pray for your board that we can find a, a good pastor for our church. Yeah, good morning. I just want to give an update on the leadership team and kind of the pastor search. So, like Michelle said, Philip came. He didn't accept our offer, and he found another church, so we're starting over. We have a meeting tomorrow at 5 with the leadership team and the search team. And then also I want to give an update. I here recently, I've become the chair of the leadership team, so if anybody needs to reach out to the leadership team, you can come to me, and uh, that's it. And who are you, and what do you do here? I'm, I'm Tim Johns, and I'm the maintenance guy. <laughs>
start the baptism, any of you with little children in the nursery, can you go get them out of the nursery, please, so that um, she can come out and watch the baptism as well? Thank you. who are following in baptism today baptism is an outward symbol of an inward act last Sunday after the service a couple of guys came and said well we want to be baptized one of them was needing to leave town so we baptized over at the local hotel's swimming pool now the thing is the water is the same here there it's the water doesn't do the cleansing so what, why would we do this? Well, Jesus gave an example. He was baptized. Jesus was baptized, came to the John the baptizer, John the Baptist, and said, baptize me. And John says, well, <laughs> Jesus, it's you. you. You should be baptizing me, right? But Jesus said, no, this is to fulfill all righteousness, to be an example for all those who would follow. So this is a picture when I dip the candidate beneath the water, it's a picture of being buried, identifying with Christ, that Jesus Christ was crucified, buried in the tomb. And then when I lift the person up out of the water, it's an image of that being re resurrected with Christ, that because Jesus lives, we live. Folks, think about that. It changes everything about the way we live. When we realize that Jesus' life means we live, it means we don't fear death. For any of us, every one of us, our own death ceases to be something that we fear. And all death is a temporary uh, separation. So I want to have a, I, we have a couple coming. I'm going to have you both come down together. This is Marcellus and his wife Tiffany. So I'm going to have you get close enough to see that it really happened. Yeah, that's what I think. Another aspect, perhaps the most Im immediate one, is that it's a public statement. Now, neither Tiffany nor Marcellus are going to attain instantaneous perfection, even when I baptize them. They're still going to struggle with the things that we all struggle with. But it's their public way of saying, we don't want to do this alone. We're serving Jesus. We're following him. So I'm going to, have, I'm going to start with Marcellus. If you'd step just to the side here. Marcellus, I want to ask you a couple of important questions. First, have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior? Yes. Is, your, is it your desire to serve him your whole life? Yes. Awesome. Because of your faith, because of your statement of faith and your intention to serve Jesus, it gives me a lot of pleasure, great pleasure, to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Tiffany also comes making her profession statement of faith. And I asked her on the phone, I said, Tiffany, why, why now? And I loved how she said it. Maybe you could say it to us. What does being baptized mean to you today? To be reborn. And to be closer to God, to have a new life with us. She said she wanted today's baptism to be a restart of her faith, of her walk with God. She said she, she had been baptized as a child but she didn't remember the meaning or even understand what that meant for her. But that is, as an adult, she was choosing Jesus, choosing to serve and to follow him. So I ask you those, those same questions. Have you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Is it your desire to serve him with all your heart? Yes. Then because of your faith, Tiffany, it gives me pleasure to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Let's, before they leave, let's pray for them together. Come on down. Let me pray a word with y'all. Father, we agree together that these are two of your precious saints. We ask, holy God, that you would work your work of transformation in their hearts, that they'd become more and more like you every day, that they would grow in grace and in the knowledge of their Lord and Savior. Teach us as a church how to be a good family to them, how to love them well. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. By your applause, I know you're affirming that their, their faith and their walk with God. This is a great opportunity to exercise what you learned today in the area of appreciation. God bless you and have an awesome day. Bye-bye. See you next week.